Good morning. How's everybody doing? It's so good to see you. And look at this fired up group of young followers of Christ up front. Man, you guys, you guys, I'm so excited to be back. I'm so excited to be here with you to this morning. What we have experienced this weekend was so powerful. Let me, let me give you just a, a snapshot of what we have done. Our theme this weekend is deep waters. It comes from a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 18.4 that says that the, the wise people's words are like deep waters. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to, we wanted to go into the deep past where most people would go with God, past where most people would go in their, not only in their relationship with God, but in their willingness to serve God. We wanted to go into the deep places of our heart. We wanted to go in the deep places of our soul. We wanted to know fully the God who is, and we wanted to lay a foundation from which we can build on everything that God wants to do in and through these students. And, uh, and I'll just tell you, church, you have an incredible group of students here. You have an incredible next generation. You have a group of students that's on fire for the Lord. You have a group of students that in some ways will lead you and lead this church into what is next because they are following Christ. They are willing to put a lot of other stuff to the side and say, Jesus, you're enough for me. So in our series, where we did was, or what we did, we started in a, uh, on Friday, Friday night, we started talking about God. And I know, uh, well, you're at church, like what else are you going to talk about, right? Like that's a no-brainer. But we wanted to talk about God in a way where we understood a little bit bigger who he was. This wasn't just for the people that had not met God. Boy, they were in the right place this weekend. And if, and if you are curious about God, curious about church, curious about the Bible, you're in a perfect place today. You're with the right group of people. You will be loved and helped. And, and this group of folks can answer your questions. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to go deeper into who God was. We wanted to see more and more of his beauty and his righteousness and his goodness and his grace grace and his mercy and his justice and his wrath and his, his uh, unendingness and his eternality. We wanted to see aspects of God that, that help us understand the truth about God, that he's bigger than we realize, that he's closer than we understand, and he's more involved in our lives than we often let him be. In fact, the characteristics of God that we looked at over uh, on Friday night, I'll just remind the students, we talked about the God who is, the God who created, the God who comes near. That's one of my favorites. I hope it's one of yours. The God who comes near, the God of wrath, the God of grace, the God who defeats, the God who rescues, and the God of wonder. And that God, that is all those things and more, can be known. Isn't that beautiful, church? We wanted to just be in the presence of that God this weekend. That was my number one prayer, is that we would be filled with the Spirit because we were in the presence of God this weekend. And that hasn't taken a step back today. Here we are, gathered together as a full church family in the presence of that God. From there, yesterday morning, we talked about the gospel, the gospel, what God has done for us, the good news of the gospel. See, what the Bible describes us in is a position that needs to be rescued, not bad people that need to become good or people that are secular and we need to be made religious. That's not what the Bible talks about at all. The Bible says we are dead in our sins. The truth about sin from Genesis 3 forward never changes. That sin will kill you. Sin will destroy. So even when we are born into sin, although we are living, walking, breathing, we are people that are walking and breathing, but dead in our sin. And if we're dead in our sin, there is no hope on our own. There's nothing that we can do to bring ourselves to life. But praise God, there is a Savior that brings dead things to life, right? 
That's incredible news. And not only does that Savior bring us to life in salvation, that Savior continues to work the power of his gospel in our lives. We talked about the transforming power of the gospel. The gospel should affect not only the, the, my insurance policy for all of eternity, but the gospel affects how I live. The gospel affects who I am. The gospel has changed me. How could I be the same that I was because I was dead and now I'm alive. That's two different states of being. And so the gospel continues when we're brought to life to mold us more and more into the image of Jesus, more and more into the image of God, more and more into what he's called us into and what he wants us to be. The gospel is not done with you and the gospel is not done with this church. It affects how you parent and how you grandparent. It affects your relationships. It affects the way you forgive because if you know you've been forgiven much, if you know that you do not deserve the grace that you've been given, you forgive others. Boy, what hope there is in that. Man, there's people walking around this community in our schools, in our neighborhoods, and where we work, and in our circles of relationships, and they need hope. They need to be forgiven. They don't even fully know how to identify what they need, but they need that hope. And we have it to offer them because of the incredible power of the gospel, the greatest force, the greatest power on this planet today is the gospel released through the church of Jesus. You are part of a huge church. You may look around the room and say, well, we've got a pretty full room. Yeah, that's a pretty big church, but you are a part of a huge church a church that exists across the world, a church that is blowing up in places like Iran, a church that is, that is not weak and is not understated. Although we may not see everything that the church is doing in the news, the church is the greatest force for good on this planet and in this city and in this neighborhood, and you are part of that. And we, we, we operate in the power of the gospel. Then we talked about purpose, meaning. I want to answer some of those big questions for our students of what's the purpose and meaning of life. And Jesus is so good to give us those answers so quickly and so clearly. He gives us this incredible commandment that he says is more important than all the other commandments that all of the law and prophets is wrapped up in this, that I want you to love God with all that you are. He quotes out of Deuteronomy. He says, I want you to love God with every fiber that makes you who you are. And the second is like it. The second is tied to it. You can't disconnect him. If you love God that much, naturally in the power of the spirit, you're going to love other people too. Not just other people that are like you or other people that believe the way you do, but other people that may have rejected God, other people that are far from God, other people that need to be loved, other people that don't feel loved because that's what Jesus has done for you. So we talked about, what did we talk about, students? We talked about actively loving God, pursuing him, and fearlessly loving others without any regard to reputation. Jesus wasn't worried about his reputation. The final step in our process is we've, as we've gone into this deep water, so we've waded out past the point of caution. We've waded out past the point that if God doesn't show up, we're, we're kind of sunk, right? But God has showed up over and over and over again in this deep water. This final piece that we're going to look at today is eternity. Eternity. And what I'd like you to do is open your Bible with me to the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3. If you want to have some real fun in 2 Peter chapter 3, Pastor Mike and I have been going through it on the podcast for about a year. I don't know how long it's been, months and months, but uh, into the Western, just shameless plug here, I guess, into the Western Wild podcast, we've been going through the book of 2 Peter. And, uh, and it has been a blast, but 2 Peter has an intensity about it. 2 Peter is not for the weak of heart. 2 Peter is deep water. 2 Peter is, is wading out past just surface level things, and Peter, in a short letter, goes deep. I mean, he talks about some difficult realities. He talks about false teachers. Here he's talking about kind of the direction that all of creation is going. And 2 Peter... 
chapter 3, verses 11, 12, and 13, he says this, since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, and that's, that's a fun way to start off the day, right? Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live looking forward to the day of God and hurrying it along. On that day, he will set the heavens on fire and the elements will melt away in flames. But we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. Eternity. Why would we want to live forever? What will eternity even be like? Eternity is supposed to be written on our hearts in a way that it affects every part of who we are because it's the direction that we are walking. It's the direction that we are going. It is what we are created for. It is more what we're created for than the life that we live now. One of the things that we've done because we wanted to lay this, this discipleship foundation with our students over the weekend is we've gone back to those first uh, chapters of Genesis over and over. Something at the beginning of Genesis has worked into every single message. At, at the beginning of Genesis, you see God's original design, that he created a world without sin and put humanity in it as the pinnacle of his creation, said it is very, very good. And he said, but, but here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to, to trust me. I want you to choose me. I want you to believe the things that I've said to you. So there's this tree, these two trees over here. I don't want you to touch them. I don't, I don't want you to get near them. I don't want you to eat of their fruit. I want you to stay away from them. And because you trust me, and what did they do? They did exactly, I, I can't knock Adam and Eve because I know my capacity to sin, do, right? Do you, do you understand your capacity to sin? I mean, if it would have been one of us, we'd have made the same mistake. They wanted to be their own God. They wanted the wisdom that it offered. They thought God was holding out on them, and they took from the fruit of the tree that God told them not to. They decided they had it under control on their own. The most beautiful part of Genesis 3 to me is that God shows back up walking in the garden. He could have closed the book right there, right? Okay, this experiment didn't work. I guess this is how it's gonna be. They've made their choice. I told them if they did this, they will die. And God shows back up. God shows back up, walking in the garden with him. He calls to them, where are you? A God that's come near. At the moment that we sinned, God came near. At the very moment that he could have ended the story, God came near. At the moment that he could have said, okay, that's it, he comes near and he makes a promise. The very first prophecy of Jesus is in that passage of the Bible. In the curse on the serpent, he says, he says to the serpent, that you only are going to have a partial victory. You're going to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And ever since then, ever since then, from the time of then till Jesus, they were waiting on the skull crusher to arrive, right? And there's no more, more perfect unity of the grace and the mercy of God and the wrath of God on sin than the cross, but I see that unity in one other place. We see the love of God on the cross that he made a way, but he, he pours out the full cup of his wrath on Jesus. Sin is still deadly. And either you and I will die for our sin or Jesus died for our sin. God pulled out the full cup of the wrath of God on Jesus on the cross so that he could die for your sin. It's God's wrath and God's love and mercy in perfect unity. When we look towards eternity, we start to see that same perfect unity. I think sometimes the people in Jesus' day, when they saw that humble Carpenter, or not the military leader, not the kind of king they were expecting, not the skull crusher they thought was coming. 
They didn't recognize Jesus. But he shows up as the skull crusher again. Man, those words in, in 2 Peter are intense, right? There are things destroyed. There are things that melt. The very elements will melt in the way in the flame. And he gives us some instructions. First, in verse 11, he says, What holy and godly lives you should live. Wait, wait, wait. If everything's going to be destroyed, that's kind of fatalistic, right? Like, if none of it matters, what am I even doing here? What does it matter? He said, no, 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 no. Because all of this is going to go away, here's what I want you to do. I want you to realize that there's a new creation coming, and you live this life for that life. You live right now in light of eternity. You live and make decisions now based on the eternal impact they're going to have. Don't invest in the stuff that's going to burn. Invest in the stuff that's going to last forever. That's why we should live holy and godly lives. Set apart holy, a description only of God that we could not apply to ourselves except he has invited us into it. He has applied his holiness to us and he has said, I have made you, I have remade you, renewed you holy in my sight. When we came to Christ, we were made holy, holy and godly lives. How do we live a godly life in this world? How do we live a godly life in a world that is corrupt, in a world that is chaos, in a world that is unjust and unfair, and so many things that define our daily lives are not the things of eternity? How do we live godly in that world? Jesus gave us the example. I, I don't want to just you know, give you like the easy example. It's, it's not easy, but here's the reality. It's simple because Jesus lived it out in front of us. And his story is written down. And, and then it's written down again, and, and it's four times over in the Bible, right? Like you can choose any of the four. And then go to the next one. Because his story of how he lived a godly life, the characteristics of God, lived out in human flesh in the example of Jesus. That's how we live holy and godly lives. Can we do that perfectly? Absolutely not. But we can come a lot closer to it together. If I'm not trying to fly solo, but, but I in, am encouraged by you and you are encouraged by me. And we're, we're open with each other about our struggles and about our sins. Where it's a safe place to be real. Where it's a safe place to say I'm insecure and I'm afraid and I'm having a hard time and I don't have my life together. If we can kind of come along in that together, we can say, God, I need you to take this stuff out of my life. And I need you to fill those places in my life with the Holy Spirit. When we're spirit-filled together, you know what that's called? Revival. When we are spirit-filled together, that is called revival. When we start to talk about eternity, for many of us, it drives up some of those fears. I want to answer some of that right now. Should I fear eternity and judgment? I want to back up in that same passage and look at 2 Peter chapter 3, but back up a little bit to verses 5 through 10. Beginning in, in verse 5, Peter is talking about some of the false teachers, and he says they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out of the water that surrounded it uh, and surrounded it with water. So he's talking about the creator God, one of the aspects of God that we looked at this weekend. Verse six, then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. He's talking about judgment and how real judgment is. If judgment has happened temporarily in the past, we know the judgment that's coming is real. We know it's on its way. In verse 7, and by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. So, so far, uh, I've just made you more depressed, and I apologize for that. I promise there's hope. Should we fear eternity and judgment? I'm going to say no. Why? Because of these next verses. Look at verse 8. So, but I'm sorry, but, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. 
But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief and the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Although there is this judgment coming and it is real, the Lord is delaying so that more will repent, that more would be rescued, that more would be saved. He is being patient for the sake of the next person. Isn't that beautiful? Because at one point in your life, you are the next person. At one point in my life, I was the next person. There was a generation before me saying, God, why don't you just come back now? Because boy, it would make my life a whole lot better. And if he had, if he had not been divine and supreme, if he would have been swayed by that, then I would have missed out on eternity because at some point he was patient for me because I was the next person. He's being patient for the next person. The next person might be in this room today. It might be one of our students. God might be working on you all weekend long and you've been holding back a little bit of yourself saying, no, no, this is mine. This, this is, I like the God stuff, but this is mine. And, and he's been chipping away at that. He's been working on you. And maybe this morning, maybe today is the day that you just let go of all that stuff you're holding on to and say, no, no, Lord, I am yours. Anything else that I am is secondary. I am yours. First, First and foremost, I am yours. We don't have to fear judgment in Christ, in, in, in position with him, because if we know him, if we have faith in him, if we have trust in him, then he is bringing us into an eternal reality that we do not deserve, that's better than what we've experienced, that's more than we can imagine. But at the same time, we need to understand the reality of this judgment that he's talking about. Unless we understand how severe our sin is and how much it deserves judgment, we won't recognize how good his grace is. There's a lot of passages in the Bible that say fear God, and it means fear God because we see his power and we see his wrath and we see his judgment. But it doesn't mean be terrified of God all the time. In fact, the most common command in the Bible is to fear not. Is the Bible contradicting itself? Absolutely not. No, no, no. If we hold the Lord in that kind of respect, if we know the power, if we know what we've been saved from, we have been saved by the grace of God from the wrath of God. If we fear that wrath enough that we accept that grace, we don't have to be afraid of anything else in this life. Any other challenge, any other reality, any other opposition, we can say, no, fear not. Fear not, for he is with me. Here's a question I get about eternity sometimes. Will it be boring? Right? Sometimes, and, and I get where this question comes from, sometimes eternity is described like a long church service and like as much as all of us like church, you're like, <laughs> no thanks. Like, uh, I, I like it, but you know, maybe, maybe not forever, right? At some point, I wanna go home. Here's the beauty of eternity. Eternity is a very full life the way the Bible describes it. It's life like this, but remove all the sin and all the tears and all the struggle and all the challenges. Think of the beauty that exists around us in Salmon, Idaho. It's that kind of beauty minus the opportunity to get like killed by a mountain lion, right? It's, it's all of the good and none of the bad. It's a beautiful, full, rich life experienced much like we experience life here, but better. In fact, the Bible describes it this way. In 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, that's what the scriptures mean when they say that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those that love him. It's full, it's big, it's better. Better is one of my favorite words that the Bible uses to talk about eternity. Paul says, I long to be with Christ, which is better by far. 
In Hebrews, it says those that, that had been faithful, that are in that hall of faith, even those that, whose names we don't know, who were killed for their faith, those martyrs that, are, that are, are being martyred today, they stand in that line of what we see in Hebrews 11, and it says they were longing for a better country, not one they had come from, but one where they were going, a better country. Can you imagine better Here's one of the most beautiful things that I think happens in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. It always feels so tragic because they have to leave. But, and there's a curse in it that's where God says, I don't want them to eat from the tree of eternal life and live forever. And, and we see that as, as a punishment. But here's the reality. He did not want them to exist forever in their state of sin. He wanted to to come to a point that has not yet happened, but one day in history will, where God says sin is done. It is completed, and all that was unjust is now made just. And we're not operating forever and ever in an eternal state where we're dealing with sin. We are living forever and ever in a full life, bigger than we can imagine, that's better in the presence of God. When I talk to David about what, and David's my son, David and, and the other kids and Whitney are watching today. Hey, hey, I don't know where to look. Hey, everybody. <laughs> We're glad you're here. David says he wants to ride dinosaurs with Jesus. I'm like, that's, why not? You know, I, I don't know how it works fully, but that sounds, why not? I, you know, if I make a promise now that it's not fulfilled in eternity, is that, I mean, I'm sinful. I just, I can't help it. But think about that, a life full. In, a, in, a, in the final chapters of the Bible, we see kings coming into the new Jerusalem, into the presence of God and, and laying their crowns before the king of kings. So, so kings still exist, cultures still exist, countries still exist. There's, there's life, there's vitality, there's a new heaven, but a new earth. And one of my favorite things too is in those final chapters of the book of Revelation, the new Jerusalem comes down. God's dwelling place is with people. He comes near again, just like he did in Genesis 3 when he came near to Adam and Eve in a much bigger way for all of us. He comes near. Cannot wait for that day. If you've ever looked towards eternity and it's kind of scared you, Keep digging, keep working, keep, keep at it because it's such good news that it's worth it. It's worth holy and godly lives. It's worth any sacrifice we would make today. Couple more questions. Will my friends be there? This question's easy to answer. They can be. They can be. But it won't be because of their heritage or where they've gone to church. It won't be because uh, of their history. It will be because you have shared with them the beautiful good news of the gospel. The gospel that has changed you can change them. We talked about how to share the gospel in a very simple way this weekend. We talked about asking someone for their story and listening and then telling our story and praying. Doesn't that sound simple? Ask them their story and listen and then tell them your story and pray. Now, you may feel like you don't have all the answers. You don't, you don't need to. In fact, it's good to have questions. It's good to say, I don't know. It's good to discover together and dig in and feast on the word of God together. But, but your friends, they can be there if you tell them. This new heaven and the new earth is a beautiful reality in the scripture. I read you what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3. Let me read you just a piece of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. He himself, God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. 
And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, write this down for what I say is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished on the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I'll give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings and I will be their God and they will be my children. In that second Peter three passage in verse 13, it says, we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth. He has promised a world filled with God's righteousness. How cool would it be if we walked out of these doors and we ran face first into God's righteousness out in the world? That's the world you're destined for. That is the world that's worth a godly life now. Now be very careful. What I'm not saying is we need to live a godly life so that hopefully God will take us into his eternal home. What I'm saying is because God has, bring, has brought us from being dead in our sins to alive in Christ, your eternal life has already begun. Your eternal life has already begun if you know Christ. And because your eternal life has already begun, what a holy and godly and new and transformed life you get the opportunity to live as you get ready for all things being new. Do you see what he makes new first? He makes you and me. He makes us new first. And one day he makes all things new. All things. So live in that new life. Don't live in the old life. Don't live in death. Don't crawl into a grave that you've been released from. Live in new life. Live in supernatural power. Live in fruit of the Holy Spirit. Let him fill you. Empty yourself of all the other stuff that we filled up in life. And let the Holy Spirit of God fill you. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. God, you're so good to us. I, I, I just can't believe your goodness. I, we don't deserve any of this. It makes no sense. And yet the reality of this eternal life that you've promised us, that reality is, is, this, is this guiding factor for our lives, the direction that we need to go. It puts in perspective everything else that we do and that we say. Is it, is it stuff that will last forever or is it stuff that will burn here? And Lord, that's not always the easiest to sort out. We need each other and we need your guidance in it. But here's what we know, Lord. We desire more than anything else your presence. As we gather for worship, we want your presence with us. Lord, we desire to be made new and filled with the Spirit. So, Lord, that we are experiencing that new life and that newness that, that, the, that the rest of the world needs and is longing for. And, Lord, we look forward to the day when you will make all things new. A world filled with your righteousness. We cannot wait we look forward. It makes us a little nervous, but we're also so excited, Lord. What I pray that we will do, what I pray for these students, God, where, where life can seem so uh, long at this point in their lives, God, I pray that they will invest in eternity, not just in what they see next, not just in what they see now, not just in the temporary. Lord, I pray for these students that you will help them invest their lives in their relationship with you. And I pray that you will help them invest their lives in relationship with others, that they might accomplish great things that last for all of eternity. And Lord, for the person today that is desperate for that hope that we've been talking about, that says, I, I, I just came in here today for a good message, but here I am wrestling with my eternity. God, I pray that right now that they will nail that down, that they would trust and believe in you, Lord, that they would pray a prayer where they ask you right now for forgiveness, where they ask you for salvation, where they praise you that you, Lord Jesus, died for them, took their place on the cross, took on the full fury of the wrath of God, and, and Lord, where they receive the life that you have promised. They don't have to wonder if you're gonna give it. If they ask for it, Lord, you have promised to give it. So Lord, I pray that, that right now across the room that there will be people coming to life 
moving from being dead in their sins to alive in Christ, or online as people listen to us, that they will move from being dead in their sins to alive in you. And Lord, as a church family together, we just wanna celebrate that. We wanna enjoy that because you are so good and you are doing miracles in our midst. Thank you for your presence, Lord. In just a moment, when we walk out these doors, let this be our greatest act of worship today. Let us leave this place proclaiming your glory, sharing with people who you are. In the powerful name of Jesus, I pray, amen.